which is basically track to diplomacy. Now, track to diplomacy is something which has worked in various parts of the world. To some extent, it has also worked between Pakistan and India in the past. But given the present relationship which we have with our eastern neighbor, uh, there is always this key question whether a track to diplomacy is uh, something which is viable in contemporary times or it can lead to some desired results. I honestly don't have an answer for this thing because when I look at the relationship between Pakistan and India, the way it has, I would say, evolved in the last few years, I don't think that track to diplomacy at this point of time is something which can open the doors for a meaningful dialogue between the two countries. And why do I say that? I say that because if you study the RSS and the mindset of the Indian politicians at this time, especially the ones who are at the helm of Paz, I don't think that at this particular time, track to diplomacy is something which is acceptable to the Indians. The reason being that you have elections coming up next year. BJP is quite comfortable. They have already been able to secure the gains which they wanted in Kashmir. They have met with little or virtually no international resistance on abrogation of Article 370. They have a relationship which is very strong with the Americans. And as far as the global international politics is concerned, India is comfortably placed. This year is important for them because of the G20. They have all the people coming to India. So honestly, with the mindset of Narendra Modi, it, it's, it is not in their interest to have a relationship with Pakistan. And why do I say that? I refer you to the statement of Jay Shankar, which was made a few weeks ago, when he said that Pakistan is somewhat irrelevant for them at this point of time, but I'm not taking his exact words, but that is the gist of what he said, in my opinion, at least. Although track to diplomacy is something which can derive some benefits, but honestly, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I know you are all academics, you are all people with experience, you will probably have a view which would be different to mine, but... Uh, as a diplomat who has worked with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 35 years, I don't think this is the right time. But saying that, does it mean that efforts should not be made? I mean, you, you never in diplomacy close the doors. You always leave a door open just to hope that something will happen. Because when I teach diplomacy, it's a very famous sentence which we use. Diplomacy, when it fails, wars start. And when wars have to end, again, diplomacy has to play its role. So with these introductory remarks, I would uh, hand the floor over to uh, Mariam. Because to be very honest, when she came up with this particular topic, I told her that, look, I want to learn from people. Because in my opinion, at least, the way things are, the way the political scenario is unfolding in India, and the way we have political instability in our country, which is causing chaos with every passing day, I don't think any back channel would work towards, let alone normalization, towards enhancing the relationship between the two countries. Thank you for a patient listening. Over to you, Mariam. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for the introductory remarks. Uh, 
Uh, without further ado, I, we will move to our uh, first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Arshi Salim Hashmi. She is going to join us through Zoom link. Uh, she had been a part of Track to Diplomacy by being a member of Women Without Borders. Uh, this transnational organization aimed at arranging dialogue between India and Pakistan. <clears throat> its activities are on a halt right now, so I would request Dr. Urshi to share her experience. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Mariam. Um, I hope you can hear me. So you are audible. All right. Thank you for <clears throat> inviting me and due to some uh, personal, um, you know, uh, reasons at home, uh, I could not just make it, um, you know, in person. Um, uh, it is quite an important topic, but uh, uh, Ambassador Saab has already, um, uh, you know, uh, given the intro. Um, but I think it's even, you know, all the more important now uh, to have some sort of uh, communication channel uh, between India and Pakistan. And why I'm saying that uh, before I talk about it, I think I will just start my argument with the question that why uh, two nuclear power states with highly emotional uh, socio-political landscape need logical worldview from the, uh, you know, for the larger good of the people. So, I mean, it is all the more important to have um, what has been traditionally the nature of the relationship and the way we have conducted our, uh, you know, often on the, um, you know, at times we had the communication and then, um, you know, just a breakdown of all the communication and hostile environment. But then this continuation of the communication in one way or other, if not directly, then indirectly through the track to, and in fact, I would argue that multi-track. So right now what we need is not just the track to, but the multi-track, which means that, it's not really important to to really have a grand um, um, you know um, uh, arrangement um, with all the um, announcements and pledges and everything. But any communication that is open, uh, it can eventually at least help in uh, some sort of, um, you know, bringing down the hostile environment. So uh, what has been traditionally the case is uh, because of the fact that our, uh, you know, when it comes to our security, uh, the, 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 the successive regimes in both India and Pakistan is still now I mean, it has always been a state centric. So it's the heart security that has been the prime focus. But over the years, we have seen that now the states um, and their status, um, you know, is defined how the human development indicators are working. And what we find here, at least in our country, uh, you know, with the economic crisis and the political situation also, I mean, the way the human development uh, has really been affected can we really afford to uh, just ha continue to have the traditional view uh, when it comes to our uh, security? So, um, and it is also important to see that countries do not progress in isolation. So even when India right now with all its development and the status that it has acquired, um, it cannot really continue with the way it is, um, you know, if it continues to ignore um, its neighborhood. You can't really completely detach. Uh, I mean, it's unrealistic. So obviously, it will have to have some sort of engagement, whether it likes it or not, whether the current regime um, is really interested right now or the future regimes, how they would be looking at it. So in any way, um, it, 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 if it is important for Pakistan to have some sort of um, you know engagement with India, I think it is equally important for India to have. Um, one of the important things um, about track two is um, that um, you know it works. Uh, you know, track two work is actually fluid and uh, it's responsive to the psychological and systemic um, you know barriers to conflict resolution. So people they just try to you know being in that process itself. It's something that we really have to talk about right now, without even thinking that uh, whether it is going to bring a result or not. 
because if we are too consumed with the result right now then we would obviously be not uh, you know would not be open to any kind of engagement so um just being in the process can sometimes help uh, reducing the tension or creating that environment that can uh, eventually uh, you know help um when we talk about the viability of uh, uh, whether it can actually work or it did work i mean we really have to see uh, what has happened in uh, last few decades i'm not going to go far in the history um, but just uh, you know post nuclear uh, south asia so 98 to 2001 and then uh, from post 911 uh, to 2014 and then the 2014 to present uh, Modi regime. Uh, I think even when we had the nuclear test, both the countries, the way world, uh, you know, looked at us and there were possibilities of all kinds of uh, um, destructions and damages, um, uh, there was this um, uh, 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 constituency for peace uh, within uh, both the countries uh, that was actually uh, got the opportunity facilitated by the U.S. and one of the famous, um, you know, dialogue, the Nimrana dialogue that, um, um, you know, continued for a, for, a, for a very long time. Um, some of the talks um, actually resulted in, um, you know, CBMs that are still in practice, and especially the military CBMs that we have. But the prime focus had been on uh, security um, and post-nuclear South Asia, how to disengage, um, you know, militarily and not to have any kind of escalation. The most important thing that was, uh, you know, in post-nuclear South Asia, we find, uh, and it was, uh, um, you know, um, in the 90s, uh, it was the citizens forum so if pakistan india people's forum on peace and democracy um uh, at least there was this this urge uh, and which is still there by the way but then of course uh, the way situation in india is more um you know um restrictive for the people to uh, uh, talk about it um, post 9-11, the entire discourse changed and even um you know the way we had uh, the different um engagements and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, arrangements, um, uh, the Indian narrative entirely changed and it was, uh, you know, from CBMs and um, uh, communication to, uh, it moved to cross-border terrorism. So anything, uh, you know, when it comes to engaging with Pakistan uh, from Indian point of view, uh, you know, had to be within the context of cross-border terrorism. And that's why, uh, you know, we saw um, 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 real problem uh, between the communication. But the, even at that time, uh, track two did not stop. Um, General Musharraf's, um, you know, era, the composite dialogue, um, General um, uh, Musharraf, um, uh, Vajpayee already during Nawaz Sharif's time had already visited uh, Pakistan. But Vajpayee, Musharraf and Mohan Singh, uh, we know how they actually worked and how the back channel worked at that time. And they were about to come up uh, with, uh, to actually implement with something which they had already come up with, the Kashmir formula uh, to actually resolve the, uh, the conflict or at least having some um, uh, solution to the problem. Um, then, of course, the uh, Mumbai attack, um, uh, you know, um, uh, after that, immediately after that, um, you know, the, the engagement lost its momentum. Uh, but still at that time, if not with in, with, in India or Pakistan, but outside the region, um, Dialogue continued. Uh, so interaction between scholars or, or ex-officials or, I mean, these meetings never actually stopped in that sense of the word. Um, how they actually translated or whether they have not, uh, translated into something, it's debatable. It's uh, it's something to be seen. But the, 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 the channels uh, for communication, um, you know, they continued even after that. And from 2014 to uh, present, uh, of course, the first few uh, two years of Modi regime, uh, there was some, um, you know, kind of thaw in the relationship. Uh, but then um, I'm not going to go in the history. You all know about it, how uh, things unfolded and where we stand right now. But even at that time, uh, you know, the Kartarpur um, um, uh, initiative, 
um, uh, and the desire uh, of, uh, you know, in both sides uh, to really have um, further, uh, you know, more such um, initiatives taken between the two countries is something that uh, shows that, uh, you know, we that there are these two parallel uh, kind of worlds. Uh, so people really want something to happen, but then what is actually happening within, uh, you know, when it comes to the local politics, um, um, public opinion, um, it seems that uh, more communication would really um, help. And um, this is what I'm going to uh, now, uh, you know, talk about when it comes to uh, the viability of track two. I will uh, discuss it in just three, very briefly, just, uh, you know, in uh, three spheres, the political security and economic viability. Why do we need that? When we say political viability, um, what is happening, uh, you know, when it comes to the civilian, the politics, the society in both the countries, there is this uh, recognition that the, the 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 pros and cons of peace and conflict is um, 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 is, is um, you know there, there there is this urge to really know whether um, the uh, the cost uh, that is being paid uh, being in conflict is uh, too high. Um, there is this urge but at the same time the worrying trend that has emerged is the growing hyper nationalism in um, uh, both the countries in fact and more so in india um given the fact that there is this huge youth bulge the young population in both the countries this hyper nationalism and the disconnect lack of communication it is creating a, a, a very, uh, you know, hate-based political environment, which is not really good for the, uh, not just now, maybe temporarily some political gains, but eventually for the region, for both the countries, it's not really going to benefit. So this uh, hyper-nationalist narrative, which is um, kind of, uh, you know, right now in India uh, more so, um, having any association or connection with the enemy is, uh, you know, um, one is uh, given, um, uh, you know, the, the, the title of a traitor or something. This is very frequently happening in India right now. So obviously things are um, uh, different uh, from that point of view. But it's still there why it is happening instead of, uh, you know, thinking that because this is happening, we should not engage. We need to really see why this is happening. And this is happening because of lack of communication, because of um, there is total uh, disconnect that the young people are unable to really see how the society is, what really uh, people think about, and how it can benefit um, you know, uh, both the countries. So this political cost that um, you know, by not being engaged um, uh, in any communication, this political cost would be too high. So in order to, um, you know, uh, deal with that, I think we need to have um, to have more engagement, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, as far as track two diplomacy is concerned. When it comes to security, of course, security, traditionally speaking, um, you know, we all know uh, how both the countries, their worldview and how they see traditional security. But there is this uh, non-traditional security uh, sphere. Uh, the entire South Asia, the rapid virtualization, the virtual world that exists, and especially in that context, the cyber um, you know, threats that exist. There is a realization that this is an area where countries uh, in South Asia and of course India and Pakistan can actually engage and talk about it because cyber uh, virtual world is no more restricted to um, um, only, uh, you know, um, um, uh, um, um, military stuff. It's more of a civilian side, uh, like banking and other spheres where this is, um, you know, uh, this can affect. So security with the cyber threats has become vulnerable. We need to have more engagement without thinking that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the core issue is uh, being, uh, because it is not being discussed, um, um, it is irrelevant uh, to engage on other issues. And the most important final thing is about the economy. Of course, the disparity, uh, the, you know, um, the level um, 
of uh, the percentage of the the uh, trade that we have um it's um, uh, you know given the fact the proximity and the nature of the region uh what pakistan especially what pakistan can benefit uh, it's a huge potential that we are not even talking about it uh i think one thing when we can learn from china uh if we really think that uh, you know um and we follow we do follow and quote china politicians and leaders also do that that china never uh, severed its uh, trade relations with even those countries with uh, with which uh, it has issues so china india china taiwan china us uh, the way they are engaged um, and they have their economic relation it says a lot about um you know without um, really giving up on their uh, political and principle stand so this is uh, something that pakistan can look into it and uh, therefore pakistan is required to dispassionately look into the option of resumption of uh, trade ties with india um, um keeping our principal stands on uh, kashmir because we have the examples in the world where nations did not change their stance they continue to talk about what where they have the differences yet given the nature of the world now that we have and for the larger benefit of the people uh, engaging in trade and economic relation is something that can be um, you know seen and uh, one of the important things uh, and i'll just uh, then finish that is um, why there is this uh, you know in this gloomy um, scenario uh, there is this optimism i think the traditional tactics are not uh, working there is this realization so there has to be something else to break the ice and for that you have to have uh, an official uh, channels um it is also a realization that the extremist um, you know both political and religious um, in in both the countries they have their own uh, interest and uh, um uh, uh, you know the, the 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 more we have um, uh, most uh, high relations the more success so um, um, these political and religious groups would get Ashi, Hello. Yes. Minutes. She didn't hear. I can't hear you. Just speak then. Ashi, you have just two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Come I'm down. just finishing. Yes, 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 okay, yes, yes. Thank you. So, uh, uh, given all that, uh, I think uh, uh, a few criticisms that uh, on uh, track two diplomacy, um, you know, why it could not uh, really. um it you know got uh, the kind of legitimacy or ownership uh, within the population one is uh, that it's an elite interaction so people generally say that people are uh, those who are uh, you know who belong to privileged uh, um, backgrounds and uh, obviously had been ex officials and all only they meet they come up with declaration and often they are repetitive um there also there is criticism that even if some out of the box solutions are uh, discussed but then eventually they go back and unable to convince the government so there are two parallel worlds one is the track to universe and one is other is the real politic at home another criticism is the localized lack of localizing the initiative so uh, people and i as i said earlier actually we need multi track uh, diplomacy not just track to diplomacy so people uh, like environmentalist uh, media agriculturists religious scholars um, you know it has to be a uh, more inclusivist and th that is why uh, the ownership is lacking when, whenever um, you know there is this uh, process um another criticism is that the exotic uh, locations where these meetings are held and then people don't actually um you know see um uh, the result of that bringing it down to the towns and cities which have actual stakes um so for example if it it comes to agricultural um you know sector cities and towns in india and pakistan which people are going to benefit or lose because of the hostile relations or the good relations 
if these meetings are frequently held in those cities, that will have a tremendous effect because then the ownership and the legitimacy of the, those efforts would not be difficult for the government to implement because the issue is that implementation is always um, difficult because of the public opinion. When people are engaged in such discussions, the leg legitimacy would not be an issue. And then the interaction should, uh, the agenda of the interaction should not be predefined. This is one of the criticism that, um, you know, let the people discuss and come up with what they want instead of the predefined um, uh, agenda. So having said that, finally, I would just say that the lack of communication between the two countries has actually helped India to continue with its plan and action in Kashmir, whatever had happened. So Pakistan needs to have a more prudent approach to forward the Kashmir cause, and that would be to engage, to penetrate, and to implement EPI, rather than sticking to uh, the old policy of total disengagement. So um, with that, um, I conclude my talk, and I would be happy to answer any question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashi. Uh, the last point you made is very significant that uh, because of lack of communication between India and Pakistan, Modi, Modi did what it, it has done in, in Kashmir. So, and you're very right that communication as a process needs to be uh, continued. And when we talk about process, we have Dr. <clears throat> Saeed Ahmed Rid. Uh, Dr. Saeed Rid has written a whole thesis on Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy. It is said that this particular forum was instrumental in opening Rajasthan uh, rail links and creating ease in visa regime and releasing fishermen. And he has also worked on Aman Ki Asha. So we would really like to know that whether this Aman Ki Asha is going to work between India and Pakistan in the current scenario or not. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity. First of all, I would like to clarify this track too, because there is a lot of confusion around this. That what is it and what is it, what it is not? Um, if we go to the similar terms which are used, uh, like unofficial diplomacy is used, and most of the time people equate track two with unofficial diplomacy, which is actually not the case, but people do this. Uh, another term is community relations, which uh, was introduced in 1960s in Northern Ireland, uh, which is equal to people to people context somehow, like community relations, people to people context. And then there is interactive problem solving, which was started in 70s by Burton and Kelman, and they came to Pakistan as well. This is uh, something um, different. And then citizen diplomacy, um, another term which came in 1981 by Hoffman. Track two diplomacy came in 1982, but it became more popular and the other terms were not less popular. Then multi-track diplomacy already uh, mentioned by um, Arshi, Madam Arshi, that came in 1991. Diamond and McDonald has talked about it. It actually just increases the tracks to nine from two to nine. Um, interactive conflict resolution is another term which is Ronald Fisher came up with. And which, which is also similar like track two, but it's like um, the more, in, it has inter definition of interactive. So through interaction, basically resolving conflicts and it involves track two as well. Um, then uh, in my PhD thesis, I also coined a new term, which was interactive people to people context, IPPC, um, which is closer to that community relation. And I use that interactive word from Ronald Fisher. Um, you can go through that, but we don't have time for that, so I will not go into that. Coming back to the track two diplomacy. Uh, track two diplomacy is actually unofficial context between middle range actors. And uh, they are non-governmental, uh, but often former track one actors. So they are basically part of track one, not something completely out of uh, the way. So what is the basic job of track two, which is which differentiates it from others? According to Fisher, the prime objective of Track 2 inter uh, interventions is to provide an informal, low-risk, non-committal, and neutral forum. Uh, track 2 can also be arranged by parties themselves, but mostly it can it, uh, it should be neutral if it is 
Um, I mean, neutral is more beneficial, but sometimes it's even parties themselves can also do this. In, in which unofficial representatives of the parties may engage in exploratory analysis and creative problem solving, free from the usual constraints of official policy and public scrutiny. So the purpose basically is to avoid that public scrutiny and the things which cannot be discussed in track one can be tackled in track two. And this is why track two and track one are very, very close to each other. I mean, we have to look at them in this way that uh, basically track one guides track two and track one basically tells you that what is something which we cannot discuss and better you discuss and give us some feedback which we can carry through. So that is basically the job of track two. So if track one is failing, then track two will fail as well because track two relies on track one very, very heavily. Now, back channel diplomacy. Back channel diplomacy is not track two. Back channel diplomacy is track one. Why? Because back channel diplomacy involves only um, the people who are part of the track one. It is just they are on the back side. They are not basically doing something in front of the people. That is why we call it back channel. So back channel is not track two. It is track one. Um, track two is the is where you have non-governmental, you know, farmer track one actors guided by track two or track one to do this thing for us, and they do that thing. Mostly this happens, and mostly basically either governments are behind this, or sometimes international donors are behind this. So that happens with this. So it doesn't come up on their own. You have to have some sort of institutional backing behind uh, the track two. Then there is another term which I mean we should differentiate this with people to people contacts or community relations. Now the job of you know uh, community relations is different. Um, as I have mentioned, this track two is basically what Saunders call quasi official process. So similar to you know uh, that that, but unlike track two, which restricts itself to supporting the track one negotiations. Uh, people to people approach believes in transforming relationships. So the purpose is completely different now. Uh, transforming relationships between individuals at interpersonal and intergroup level. Now the job is completely different. People to people contacts and community relations basically work with the people, not with the government actually. So their job is completely different. Uh, like uh, you know, perception changes at the people's level. That is also their job. Their job is basically to prepare ground for the you know negotiations actually. Um, so uh, and they do not only work on the middle range. Middle range obviously is one of the very important you know middle range actors part of this. But people to people context should reach to the grassroots level if it has to be effective and long term. And the other thing is people to people context and conflict transformation. I mean, the, this is, I mean, this people to people context approach is conflict transformation approach, whereas the track two approach is basically conflict resolution approach. Now, that is also should be understood properly that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that track two approach is conflict resolution means they basically help in the negotiation process. They do not help creating or building peace at the popular level. This is not their job. That is the job of the people to people context and conflict transformation. So conflict transformation pieces basically is relationship changing um, at the grassroots and at the uh, middle range as well. So this is something which I, th I thought should be very important to keep in mind before we move forward. Multi-track diplomacy, you already know, I will, uh, another thing which we should keep in mind that these are complementary, compl complementary to each other. We shouldn't see them as exclusive from each other. Uh, all these tracks are very, very complementary and rely heavily on each other. As I have mentioned, track one, track two relies on track one. Um, uh, even, uh, you know, people to people approach also relies because you know, you can't have people to people contacts at good level if the two governments are not allowing people, then you have to go through the, you know, internet and others, but you can't really meet with each other. So government is very, very, uh, you know, there. The basic job of people to people approach basically is to complement negotiations and prepare a ground for negotiations and make peace sustainable. Because if there is no people to people context, we believe, and there's no conflict transformation, then even if with negotiations, you come up with a solution, I mean, both the parties agrees, as we have seen in case of uh, Oslo cards, 
still they will fail because there is no ground for the peace. So the job of people to people approach is prepare the ground for the peace where peace becomes sustainable. So that is something I thought should be very important to understand. Now, when we look at, you know, Pakistan, India history, and there are a lot of, you know, um, things which have happened at the track two level, I will just name for a few. So for, for you to keep in mind that what has <clears throat> happened, some of them were mentioned by um, Arshi already. Uh, problem solving workshops in the 70s were the first something which an unattractive diplomacy which happened regarding India and Pakistan. And then um, Nimrana dialogue, before that, World Net 1990 happened, 1990, which took to Nimrana. Nimrana continued until 2011. Uh, Pagwash conferences have been there 2004, 6, 7. Balusa 2000, 1995 to 2003. Uh, um, Chowd, uh, Chowd, Ch Ch Chow Pariya dialogue which was track two dialogue, which is actually started in 2008, but India-Pakistan League started in 2018, and out to 2022, they have four or five meetings. Um, one another thing which I consider as track two, which normally people don't consider as track two, is Kashmir study group, if you have studied about, you know, Kashmir study formulas. So they started in 1996, and they had some kind of uh, Kashmir resolution formula for Kashmir study group, uh, which came in 2005. I'll talk more about this, but these are track two initiatives. And then people to people, um, I would say uh, they started basically 1980s. I have the whole article on this, which was published by IRS, so you must have uh, the access to that. Um, you can go through this, that uh, basically it started with alumni. Uh, Royal Indian Military College, uh, Dehradun, because people from who came to Pakistan also visit, uh, you know, studied there, and then Kinnaid College, Lahore, they also had alumni networks in 1980. Then uh, Indo Pak Business Commission, 1982, traders started meeting, uh, drama artists, uh, Ajoka Theater, you must have heard about. Tahrike Niswa, um, Shima Kramani, um, she also went to India and had interaction with, at the drama and arts level. And then workers and trade unions even made, made. like uh, Piler, you must have heard about. Piler uh, Karamat Ali, he invited a lot of Indians here and went to India. Uh, South Asia part Partnership, they all started in 1980s before PIPFPD came into being. So PIPFPD, when it came into being, it was a kind of an umbrella organization, which actually all these people who were doing people-to-people -people con contact work between India and Pakistan were part of it. So they just united together. And you must have heard about big names, Dr. Mubashir Hassan, Nasma Jahangi, Naseem Zahra, Tapan Bose, uh, VA Pandikar, all these guys were part of this uh, effort. PIPFPD came in 1995 and still is there. How far it is effective, that is another case. But then SAFMA, Aman Kiyasha, and recently South Asia Peace Action Network, SAPAN, which came in uh, 2020 uh, during the uh, you know pandemic. And it actually, SAPAN is more uh, on internet than anything else. So their activity is actually every month they have sort of meeting. And basically people are same, but organizations are different, but people are same. So what is the, what are the because this was the question, strengths and weaknesses. What is the strength? Uh, track two, I think, uh, the weak, what is the weakness first? Uh, track two relies heavily on the two governments are international donors. So that is why if there is no support from international donors and government, they will do nothing. And this we have seen with different, uh, so that is a weakness for them. For the people to people context, in the case of India, Pakistan, we have seen that, you know, the environment affects a lot. When there is supportive environment, we have seen people to people context really flourish. But then, then you have no such good environment at the, you know, track one level, then obviously there is a lot of problem. But the basic job of these is during the crisis. So that is why it's very important. Um, uh, then strengths, people to people, track two provides a forum to sort out hurdles and conflict resolution that they have done. I will show you that how, what they have done. People to people to come, uh, contact keeps the ball rolling even during the crisis. And the best thing is when two countries are not meeting, not at the official level, there's complete, you know, like uh, um, blockage of everything. It's still people to people contact goes and this, uh, they keep doing their own thing. So because they don't do not rely on governments. 
Now, the another issue which you had raised in your um, that track two, whether it leads to track one or not. I mean, I have in my thesis a lot of things about this, but I will mention a few things here. Like Lahore Declaration 1999, if you all remember, that actually draw its inspiration from the PIPFPD. Ji? Okay, okay, sure. So just... Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, Lahore Declaration and then Ceasefire 2003 also uh, uh, role from um, Dr. Mubashir Hassan. Um, then uh, Visa Relaxation Agreement 2012 and Trade Agreement 2012. Uh, AK was very, uh, I mean, Aman Kiyasha was behind this because uh, business people made on this Milnendo campaign for uh, Visa Relaxation was there. And this uh, back channel formula, which we know as Musharraf formula, actually was the formula which was uh, given by Kashmir Study Group and refined later on by these. So we can see that track two and people to people contact, both approaches are actually supporting to the track one. Track two with the BJP, I would uh, just <clears throat> say a few words. <clears throat> I mean, BJP, we should not look at just from the perspective of Modi. Because Vajpayee was also Prime Minister of BJP. And during Vajpayee's time, we had this peace process. And it was, uh, and Dr. Mubashir Hassan had very close links with Vajpayee, and he uh, shuttled between Musharraf and uh, Manmohan uh, uh, so, uh, and Vajpayee for this uh, 2003 offer, which we you all know. Uh, so, Mindset, I have already talked about a little bit. I will just come to the conclusion. Uh, track two and people to people, people approaches are complementary. So therefore, they must all be used and supported, in my opinion. Peace is a long-term process and not anyone. I think this is, this is very important to understand that we should look not look at some peace as an event that, okay, this is happening now. Peace is a process and you have to be very patient with this. You cannot just ask for results, immediate, quick results. There are no quick fixes in peace. That is one thing which we should keep in mind. Only continuous peace process will bring meaningful fruits. And we have seen this uh, in Pakistan, India history. We had only four years of continuous peace process, 2003 to 2008. And we have seen the results in that phase. All 75, 75 years you have been fighting and no results. Four years and results, you can see Musharraf formula on which Kashmir was almost resolved. So it pays off when you have continuous peace process. If India and Pakistan desire, uh, uh, peace is desired, then the policymakers must be genuinely interested in long-term peace rather than playing games with each other. This is, I think, very important because they keep playing games with each other and they want results, immediate results. And when they, you don't get res immediate results, you go back to your games. This will not work in that way. Uh, lastly, India and Pakistan must do away with their mutual mistrust because that is the real problem. If they genuinely want to build peace and for this track to and people to people -to -people contract can play a very important role. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Saeed Saab, for, uh, for your enlightening talk. And thank you for clarifying the differences of uh, different levels of track to track uh, di diplomacy. Um, and now our third speaker is uh, Dr. Farhan Hanif Siddiqui. He has extensively worked on theoretical aspects of uh, conflict resolution, and he will enlighten us on the challenges and potentialities of conflict resolution between India and Pakistan. So over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mariam. And I'm really thankful to Ambassador Nadeem Riaz to the Institute of Regional Studies for inviting me today. Uh, I'm going to speak not as much about track two. Uh, I think Dr. Saeed and Dr. Arshi are better positioned and they've spoken really well. Uh, but I'm going to speak about the nature of India-Pakistan relations as they exist today, number one. Uh, the contemporary challenges, if you will, uh, which make peace, stability, conflict resolution difficult, number two. Uh, but number three, arguing that why the policies that India and Pakistan pursue against each other, they're bound to fail anyway. So it's better if they come together. That's a better alternative. And I'll come to that uh, at the end of my presentations. Uh, so starting with understanding the entire nature of India-Pakistan relations, I think, and uh, 
most of you might agree that we've always interpreted india pakistan relations from a he very heavy realist lens so it's always about the strategies of wars and conflicts and violence that both these states can pursue against each other uh, and even academics or journalists or even uh, policy elites they've always been more concerned about winning against the other uh, so the nature of the relationship largely after 47 has been very, very zero sum. And that is the entire problem. Uh, there's a very interesting book, which I read last year by Christopher Clary. It's called The Difficult Politics of Peace. Uh, it's an excellent book, which tells us why peace between India and Pakistan is difficult. Uh, and while I was reading this book, I, I started thinking about the alternative. That we're always speaking about why peace is difficult why cooperation is difficult, why building trust is difficult. Uh, and I started to invert the argument and think about why pursuing conflict, violence and wars is difficult, is, is equally difficult, and why these policies are ultimately bound to fail as well. So it's not about peace initiatives failing. It is also about conflict, violence and war initiative or policies failing as a result. Uh, and I'll come to it at the end of the presentation. I think when it comes to India and Pakistan, uh, if there is a will to power in the Nietzschean sense about both states wanting to dominate others, I think the silver lining or the relative optimism is that there is also the will to associate. And that cannot be taken out of the India-Pakistan equation, never. So start recently with the Nawaz Sharif, uh, sorry, Nawaz Sharif, uh, Modi phase, 2014-16, uh, Musharraf and uh, Manmohan Singh, Musharraf and Vajpayee, then Nawaz Sharif, Vajpayee, and you can stretch back to Zia and uh, uh, Rajiv Gandhi and even Benazir. And so there's always this will to associate with each other. Uh, and that's the relatively optimistic bit about the India-Pakistan relationship. So even now, uh, Pakistani prime ministers, for example, continually speak about engaging in terms of trade and business with India, and that is something I think interesting. So if, if let's say Kashmir, meaning that's the overall, so if Kashmir, let's say typ typifies conflict or a situation of violence between India and Pakistan, the other K, which is Kartarpur, I think that typifies engagement. And both these Ks, Kashmir and Kartarpur, I think they work together. And, and, and I think that is the overall nature of their relationship. And that is a certain amount of optimism on my part. Okay, the contemporary challenges, meaning what, what makes uh, the present state of India and Pakistan really difficult. I think uh, the first is uh, the change status of the Kashmir dispute or the Kashmir conflict, as we in Pakistan now like to call. Uh, so what India has done, and again, that's a very zero-sum thinking on India's part, is that they, according to their interpretation, they have now resolved the Kashmir conflict. So they've domesticated Kashmir, uh, they've pushed Pakistan away, according to their strategic and political calculation. Uh, and Pakistan does not exist anymore when it comes to Kashmir. So the Indian Defense Minister Rajnath Singh, in August 2019, when India revoked Article 370, 35A, he said, now we will only speak about Pakistani Kashmir. Indian Kashmir ka humne masla hal kar diya. Wo hamara ho gaya. Right, and this is what happens to conflicts. This is what the literature teaches us that you do when you do not even interpersonal relationships, when you do not manage resolve conflicts at the right time, they become only more and more complex. Uh, so the Kashmir conflict has truly, truly become more and more complex, uh, uh, complex after August two thousand nineteen, and of course, I meaning one of the reasons why it has become because you now have a very uh, nationalist uh, government under the BJP, which which pronounces a very unapologetic sense of nationalism. Don't worry about the consequences. We are Indians, we are Hindus, Pakistan is our competitor. This is something that we need to do. Consequences, we shouldn't care about. So yes, Article 370 needs to be revoked. We need to domesticate Kashmir. This is the way uh, to go about it. Pakistan's strategy after 2019, of course, is to what Happy Mon Jacob calls is Kashmir shaming India. So we're now internationalizing the Kashmir conflict. And I think one of the difficulties on the part of the Pakistani state is that it becomes very difficult for any incumbent government to make overtures towards India without incurring reputational cost. So very recently, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif, he gave a statement saying that we want to do trade or engage with India. I can't remember the exact nature of the statement. And that, and then it invited criticisms from a number of quarters. Oh, what about, he did not mention 
the revocation of Article 370. He did not mention the revocation of Article 35. And then the Foreign Office had to step in and say, no, Pakistan's position is that we will only talk to India after the revocation of Article 370 is resigned. It, right? So that's the problem on our side. Uh, and that's a challenge, the entire change in the nature of the Kashmir conflict now. Uh, the other sort of challenge in the India-Pakistan equation, I think it's the domestic challenge, which is how India is viewed in Pakistan and how Pakistan is viewed in India. Uh, and it happens meaning both during election cycles as well as non-election cycles. So Pakistan is a very incendiary issue in India that we know. Uh, and the reason why it is an incendiary issue because... Uh, India has to has had to endure a number of repeated attacks by non-state actors across the border. Uh, and that, so to speak, invites an intense sort of emotional, uh, uh, you know, a very incendiary logic from the Indian side that we have to punish Pakistan. Uh, because after Kargil 1999, you've seen this repeated trends of non-state actors crossing borders and hurting us, injuring us. Uh, and that is the entire problem. So Pakistan, and to speak about Pakistan in India, and especially under the BJP, I think it's a, it's a very, very difficult issue. In Pakistan, it's the same. Uh, although not as much during the election cycles, but even in the non-election cycle. So uh, when uh, Nawaz Sharif invited Narendra Modi in December 2015, and I think that was a very interesting moment in India-Pakistan history, because Modi, when he flew off from Delhi and when he reached Kabul, he, he coined a very interesting phrase. I don't know if any of you remember. He said, breakfast in Kabul, tea in Lahore, and dinner in Delhi. And, and I was so happy. Huh? Dinner in Delhi. Bre uh, breakfast in Kabul. Yeah. Breakfast in Kabul, tea in Lahore, and dinner in Delhi. And I was like really happy. You know, now there's a leader, you know, who's in you know, espousing a vision of regional trade, regional connectivity, and that is coming from the very top. And Nawaz Sharif, of course, being a businessman, agreed with that idea. Uh, but what happened to Nawaz Sharif later? Uh, Modi ka jo yaar hai, khaddar hai, khaddar hai, right? And that sort of criticisms came his way. And I think now, um, you know, with, with the current round uh, and what is happening, I think when the PMLN goes into elections against the PTI, I'm sure they will make use of this of the claim and the language that it was under PTI's government that Article 370 was revoked by India. So it was the PTI government, it was Imran Khan's uh, leadership, if you will, which failed Pakistan on Kashmir. So again, it you know, so in, in, in terms of making any forward movements, I think domestic politics uh, is a huge challenge. And that is something that we need to think about. Uh, th there are many challenges because paucity of time and just uh, uh, giving out a few. I think the, the third and a very important challenge on the part of both India and Pakistan is that we have failed to evolve a shadow of the future. Uh, you know, uh, Meaning, uh, rhetorically speaking, we always make this argument, oh, look at the Gora, look at the Westerner. He plans for the next 50 years. And my question is, what prevents us from planning for the next 50 years? Hmm? So if they can plan for the next 50 years, what stops us from planning for the next 50 years? So the problem with India and Pakistan, the leadership, is that we are involved in day-to-day -day firefighting. Oh, this hybrid warfare. Oh, this cross-border terrorism. Oh, this Kulbushan Yadav. Oh, these jaish e Mohammed or whatever actors in Kashmir. And this day-to-day, -day, very narrow, very myopic, firefighting mode of thinking, it traps you into a very regressive, you know, logic where you can't, think, uh, you know, healthily on what to do in the future. And I think this is where the Indian Pakistan uh, leadership has failed miserably. So whenever they have engaged, for example, Nawaz Sharif Modi, uh, just for a few months, for a little while, there's a sense or an environment of engagement, and then all of that withers away. And there needs to be done something about it, I think, in the larger time. Okay, now coming on to the bit about uh, what Indian Pakistani meaning the policies that they institute against each other in terms of winning, that they're trying to win against each other, it's a very zero-sum, but why these zero-sum strategies are bound to fail anyway? Now look at India's domestication of Kashmir. Uh, so August 5th, they say, oh, Kashmir, now we have resolved the Kashmir issue, it has become a domestic issue, and now we have isolated Pakistan, we'll only speak about Pakistani Kashmir, nothing, nothing else. 
I think the net result has been largely negative for India, meaning the opposite has taken place. So Kashmir has now really become an internationalized issue, meaning August 5th, 2019, Indian actions have provided the perfect opportunity for Pakistan to internationalize the Kashmir conflict, number one. Number two, now because this is happening under BJP's watch, which is a very, as we know, majoritarian, nationalist, Hindu-dominated government, if you will, it has also shifted the focus of the Kashmir conflict attention away from the fact that, you know, these jihadist actors are the one perpetrating violence to the fact that now the Hindu nationalist government in Kashmir is perpetrating violence. Just see what the BBC documentary did and the kind of, uh, you know, rage that went out against India. So Indian policies of domestication, domesticating Kashmir again are having the entire opposite effect. Kashmir is only becoming more inter... So it's the perfect opportunity for Pakistan. And the third element, I think the Americans are now more interested in South Asia. Uh, after February, the the recent the most recent crisis episode that took place, and of course after August 5th, because now uh, crisis situations between India and Pakistan, after what India has done in August, I think they have become more uh, they've become they've become more of an happening event now. Meaning the risk of a crisis emerging between India and Pakistan, I think it's 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 greater than what it was before. So the Indian policy strategy, I think domesticating everything, I think it's failing. Uh, the opposite is happening. So it's not succeeding in that sense. And Pakistan and the US and others, they are very, very interested now in Kashmir and maybe driving out a solution. On the Pakistani side, I think our policy of associating with non-state actors, I think the most damage that has come to Pakistan in the last 30 years, to Pakistan's foreign policy, to Pakistan's image, has been our association with these non-state actor jihadist groups. I mean, we can cry over the fact that we gave away 75,000 lives and billions of dollars of investment during the war on terror, but the exact problem to our foreign policy emanates from this alleged association. Now, the problem is that whenever we are making policies or thinking about foreign policy, thinking about international politics, oh, I'm just finishing. We, we make the argument, oh, norms do not matter. I think they matter a lot. So the Americans do not want to see Pakistan associating with norms. Even the Chinese do not want it. The Russians do not want it. It's, so it's not only about the U.S. So this norm is important. And I think our future foreign policy or our strategizing, strategizing on Kashmir, if you will, needs to be as far removed as possible from this association with non-state actors. I, the effort, FATF challenge, I think, we've all, we've all seen the kind of sanctions that come around. So just to conclude quickly, I think uh, this politics of war, winning, dominating others, uh, meaning India or from the Indian side to Pakistan, I think they're unlikely to work. They will only perpetuate more chaos. They will only perpetuate more misery. They will only perpetuate more troubles. And I think India and Pakistan are better off uh, being self-reflective, uh, thinking about their own policies and you know assessing where they've gone wrong, and then rather than blaming the other side uh, for whatever has bad, uh, whatever has been bad uh, in the India-Pakistan equation. And this is where I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Siddiqui, uh, for a very introspective presentation. Uh, you're very right, you made a very interesting uh, comment that there is always a will to associate between India and Pakistan. And this is why I think recently Indian High Commission, Indian Deputy Indian High Commission has uh, expressed his uh, intent to have better relations with uh, Pakistan. So with that, I'll move on to our fourth speaker. Uh, our fourth speaker is Dr. Zainab Ahmed. She has joined us from Lahore. And she has a deep interest in strategic communication. So uh, we would like to learn from you uh, that how your research can help uh, in the negotiation process of Indian Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, a lot has been said uh, on track to and multilateral diplomacy. Uh, I would just start 
by saying that before coming on to strategic communication on which is the recent area of my research before this i my core area of research was water security and national security of pakistan and certainly india becomes a very important actor in that uh, i would uh, like to start with two facts Indian Deputy High Commissioner, as you just said, he visited Lahore Chamber of Commerce this month, and he said that he wanted India wants to improve relations with Pakistan, and the very important factor is trade, which can uh, lead both of us to some improvement. And in the same year, 2023, on January 25th, India gave a notice to Pakistan to modify Indus Water Treaty and respond within next 90 days. That has not been uh, talked about much. I just saw uh, Ambassador Shafkat Kakakhil's one article on this. This is a very important uh, development on which either side did not comment much. And we do not know what that notice has actually, apart from that the media, the Indian media, what they said about it. What I think is very intense in Pakistan-India relations, and that has been since 1947, that every matter in Pakistan and India is securitized. Whatever we talk about, that is intensely securitized. And when we see even in India, Pakistan becomes the most important issue during every elections. Uh, what we need to do is I, I won't say this has happened, this has been happening. A lot has happened in the past. A lot of derailments and a lot of developments have happened. What we need to do, where we stand today. We stand today in a world where India is a country of 1.25 billion people, where India is a country which do does have a border uh, dispute with China and Ladakh, but China did not stop 79 billion US dollars trade with India. India is a country uh, to which uh, our exports were just 300 to 400 million dollars in 2019 when it revoked our uh, MFN status, but Indian exports to Pakistan were, uh, were of 2 billion dollars. And after the revocation, it has costed uh, the economy of at least Amritsar city a lot. Uh, I would say that uh, when we say that, yes, Article uh, 370, revocation of Article 370, that is something we would not go beyond. And certainly that is our uh, line, bottom line, which we cannot cross and we cannot talk about. I would say that there are so many issues from where we can start and as all uh, the worthy panelists said that there is no way that the communication should be severed. And communication should be started from a point where you find more room of dialogue. Whenever we talk about Kashmir issue, there becomes a situation where both the countries become hostile to their interior uh, internal environments, internal political cultures, internal political dynamics. A very important issue which is closely associated with Kashmir issue is water issue. And even at the time, right after 1947, when the dispute, water dispute started, uh, the article which was written, which initiated this process of uh, water cooperation and eventually which led to Indus Water Treaty, that was Professor Lilenthal's that Kashmir and other Korea in making, which said that if you want to resolve Kashmir issue, start from water issue. Now, when I say about this, uh, notice India gave to Pakistan on 25th January, that clearly shows that a, a situation which was brewing in India for last one decade very prominently and for two decades at least, that there should be modifications in Indus Water Treaty. Because they always say, we say that they are stealing the water and we say they are doing water terrorism. But their stance is that Pakistan already got 80% of Indus water. So they want the modifications in that. Now, there and a very important uh, um, strategic uh, studies expert of India, Brahma Chillani, he wrote an article in 2016 in which he said that if you want to revoke Indus Water Treaty, you can invoke Article 62 of Vienna Convention on Laws of Treaty. 
And there are, uh, according to Article 12 of the Indus Water Treaty itself, although either of the parties cannot revoke it unilaterally, but there are modifications possible. And let me tell you one thing. There are uh, people in Pakistan who also believe there should be modifications. Now, there is no issue in modifications because undoubtedly we are at a stage of climate change where we need certain new realities to deal with. But modifications at what cost, in which environment, and from what grounds we need to depart in order to reach with new, uh, to be settled with the new normal. That is very important. Then uh, a very important thing is Dr. Farhan and Dr. Saeed also uh, mentioned Kartarpur. Kartarpur is also uh, the result of multi-track diplomacy started by the Americans. So why can't we start, uh, take some initiative from a point where there is less dispute until now, if I say no dispute at all, because unfortunately everything ends between India and Pakistan in a dispute. And as Dr. Farhan rightly said that whenever someone talks about anything, even in Pakistan, it becomes a hostile environment for that politician also. Then I see a second very important related issue is food. Food is a cumulative problem for this region, for the world now, after Russia-Ukraine conflict. And let me bring your attention towards a reality in South Asia. There is an agricultural and food cycle. A time comes when the garlic is produced in India and it is not in Pakistan, then it goes to, the weather uh, takes it to Afghanistan and then to Central Asia. So food can play a very important role if we start uh, talking about food, even before water. Then about energy. Energy is a global issue, is a humanitarian issue. That's very important. And after Russia-Ukraine war, everyone is worried about energy and a country like India, which is such a big economy. So, and that certainly is our need also. So these are the issues where we, I, I in my reckoning, at least we can pick up some pace. Now, how, when the states are not in a mood to talk, and the states have no room to talk. Uh, I, I believe, as a student of international relations, that India, although there is hyper-nationalism, although there is an issue of RSS, BJP in India, but over the decades, since the time of Nehru, India enjoys one image in the world, and that is uh, because of India's soft power. And India's huge cultural soft power. And the world looks at India as an economy of $2 trillion and a market of 1.25 billion people. This is a reality. And we are in this geography which we cannot change. And I will come back to this Indian Deputy High Commissioner's statement who said that uh, India needs a way to Central Asia Central Asian markets, especially when the US and European Union markets have come under pressure. So India needs that. And uh, Pakistan also set, has set clearly its strategic di uh, dimension to be geoeconomics. At least we have said this in our national security policy. Now coming to my area of research, and I'm saying this out of uh, my research, which I did in last one and a half year, and my paper is about to be published in IPRI journal, uh, strategic communication. I try to develop a framework how to implement the national security policy of Pakistan through the framework of strategic communication. Now, strategic communication is something which is beyond the traditional diplomacy, as the scholars rightly said, that even track two diplomacy is very closely associated with track one diplomacy. All the track have some uh, tinge of that official uh, color or official hand in it. So, and, and I don't say the traditional uh, strategic communication does not have that. So, but strategic communication allows uh, a Rediwala standing at Vaga to connect a Rediwala standing at Atari. Strategic communication enables uh, a billionaire businessman here in Lahore to connect with the billionaire businessman in Delhi. Just we need to do is that the state must keep its stance for some pe uh, period of time and let the people do. 
let the societies come forward let the academia come forward and strategic communication is something that is multi-layered multi-pronged uh, multi-faceted and that is not confined to only we have to do this then uh, the uh, an important solution also may be that russia has started international north south trade corridor and russia is very keen to connect that uh, to india and uh, after this energy crisis they would be more keen to connect it to india and why can't we take a different stance and we say that just connect us to that we can also facilitate what if india's oil comes uh, through a stop at gavadar what what's harm in it so the world is changing and when we look at india we have always been looking uh, at india india is at our, our adversary no doubt and now us is very close to india yes us is very close to india us has signed three foundational agreements of india providing unmatched military and strategic capabilities to india like i would just say that after limoa india is able to use even the us bases in indo pacific in uh, us is doing and india is doing all what they can to contain china but china has other options do we have so many options we have to live in this geography and what is wrong if we become the trade the passage in the trade corridor from south asia to central asia and then from central asia to southeast asia that is certainly going to be beneficial for us but that requires a total change in the environment in the strategic environment in the political environment in the culture of pakistan also in the political culture of pakistan i would just take one and a half more minute and by saying that i would uh, talk about two books in the last in 2016 a book came uh, from uh, two very important american experts on south asia george perkovich and toby dalton not war not peace that book is very important that gives a very important recipe to india how to deal with pakistan they say you cannot uh, do the naval blockade the military blockade the air force nuclear uh in any way conventionally you cannot stop pakistan and you cannot convince pakistan uh, to stop cross border terrorism into india to which they associate everything with when coming to pakistan so they said that there is only one thing which in the, um, internally can defunctionalize pakistan and that is already ha pakistan is having asymmetric conflicts and these are the fault lines which can help india so india can use it and perhaps it's a coincidence that book was published and soon after this or perhaps soon before this kulbashan yadav was arrested from balochistan a very recent book from a senior indian diplomat sharad sabarwal india's pakistan conundrum he concludes it by saying that yes use water against pakistan use economy against pakistan use these fault lines against pakistan and we keep, will keep on looking at pakistan as a dysfunctional state but it is here to stay and we need to deal with pakistan as a dysfunctional state so their options for to deal with pakistan through um, diplomacy track 1 track 2 and perhaps up to track 9 would be to deal with pakistan as a dysfunctional state and let's be very clear that at least i am i am clear for now that they are not going to leave any fault line in pakistan to be used against pakistan so there must be the stake of people for the sake of people and when we convert all these issues kashmir issue water issue food issue into humanitarian crisis international humanitarian crisis that can be of greater benefit for this entire region for pakistan at large for india and the world beyond thank you very much uh thank you dr zainab for uh, bringing in pertinent issues of uh, food insecurity energy and water in the discussion and it is also said that uh, the, uh, the third war of india and pakistan is likely to occur on water it's so, another matter of huge debate <laughs>
Uh, so before entering into the uh, round of question and answer session, um, President Iris would like to share his comments. So over to you, sir. You know, it was really a pleasure listening to all of you, uh, including Dr. Arshi. Uh, I hope you will forgive me for being extremely blunt. Um, I think over the years one has become that way. You see, the basic thing is you can talk about track one, track two, track, track seven, track nine. But that's immaterial. The basic thing is for any track to function, you need the political will. What I started saying right in the very beginning, I just leave the audience with a couple of questions. I don't have answers to them. Is there the political will in India or Pakistan? to take forward the dialogue. Secondly, do we have a Kashmir or an India policy for the long run? Or is it just a knee-jerk reaction to things which are taking place? That's another thing. Obviously, track, track one and track two or whatever tracks, they complement one another. You know, whether it is bilateral, whether it is multilateral. But the basic thing is, you actually require the political will to make or to carry things forward. Then you have this big debate whether it is viable or whether it is probable. A thing can be viable, but like, you know, what is the probability of that with the leadership which, which exists? I personally, it's a very personal opinion, I think when you look at, well, if you synthesize Pakistan-India relationship, I think you can divide them into maybe three or four major categories. It's a very simplistic view, I confess to that. One is political, one is economic, the other is people to people. In rest, we put everything into non-traditional, which is like environment, water issues, food security, poverty, health, whatever. As far as political is concerned, you will always end up with issues of terrorism and you will end up with Kashmir. As far as the economic thing is concerned, they gave us the MFN status, they withdrew it. But again, there is a big debate. If today you open the trade with India, what would happen to your own economy? What are you producing which you can export? Obviously, yes, you can do a lot of exports from India and you know things will be much cheaper for the people in Pakistan. But what about the balance of payment issue then? Then the third thing is people-to-people -people contacts. I think that is something which, regardless of whatever the relationship has been between the two countries that has existed, maybe we should invest more in that. And lastly, the environment. It, if it is affecting us, it is affecting them, it is affecting the entire South Asian region. So I personally feel that if there is a glimmer of hope to take things forward in this environment, which is so toxic between the two countries. I think maybe environment is the only area where any track can make a sort of a headway, which could lead to some confidence building measures, which could take things forward. And, you know, with this thing, please, please, you know, please, please challenge whatever I've said. And I think we can have a good discussion now. Over to you, Mariam. Um, thank you, Ambassador, for uh, your very um, enlightening views. Um, and in case of, uh, it's not just political will in case of Pakistan, I think it's it's also political stability that is important in order to move forward in the direction of negotiations with India and Pakistan, in between India and Pakistan. So with that, we open the floor for a question and answer. So, Okay. Uh, just on political will, I would like to uh, say, I mean, political will, if we look at this, in my opinion, it sometimes exists, sometimes goes back. If we look at, um, I mean, there are two, in my opinion, there are two things. One, um, job of people to people contact is to basically create that political will, will which doesn't exist at the time. Um, I will give you the example of uh, 90s. There was no political will in both India and Pakistan to talk with each other, because if you remember the there was policy Kashmir first mm -hmm. from Pakistani side that if you are not talking about Kashmir, we will not talk about anything else. And we had negotiations which break down on this point. 
then BIPAPD came up and they started saying that we should not fight on agenda of what we should talk about. We should make it comprehensive dialogue with where we should talk about nuclear, where we should talk about CBM, where we should talk about everything. And then came Lahore declaration. So political will came with Nawaz Sharif and, you know, political came with Vajpayee and others. Political will was not there before, but it was, it came and it, people to be context was helpful in creating that political will. Then it went back. So we have seen political will have, we have seen political will exist sometimes like 2003, 2004 to 2008. Political will even existed with Modi 2015, 2016. Political will now doesn't appear to be there in India, but in Pakistan still, yes. So what about maybe in a year or year or two, political will can come back to India as well. So I, in my opinion, it's, uh, I mean, uh, you know, political will is not something which is, uh, you know, fixed. It moves with the time and with the situation. Yes, a small, very short because I really want to... That to, to some extent, I agree with what Dr. Said uh, said, and I would say that everything has a political economy associated with it. The conflict has a political economy, the war has a political economy, the peace has a political economy. Right now, perhaps the political economy of severed relations and no dialogue and conflict is beneficial for all sides. But once the process starts from any one point, as um, Nadeem Sab said, that perhaps from environment, because it has become such a global issue that no one can take a backseat from it now, especially countries like India and Pakistan. So one, uh, once the, that political economy would be associated with uh, some issue of peace and people will start getting something, then eventually the governments might have to change the position. Okay. Uh, so... Anyone who would like to ask a question? Yes, Arish. Um, I have an observation. It's an excellent uh, presentation. Um, so you, uh, in Pakistan, not in trouble with Pakistan. As you've said in your, your presentation, that it's Mirkor also national focus on the Hindu nationalist government of India. So it's not essentially in the interest of India as well, not to have a dialogue with Pakistan. But we've seen in the past how many times, have, as Dr. Said said, like a sustained peace process has been scuttled by non-state actors. The very event that you referred to in your presentation about Prime Minister Modi making a stopover in Lahore was not far long ago. It was in 2015. It was very, very recent. And as ma'am also referred to the, the Indian DHM's uh, Deputy High Commissioner's, uh, you know, call for, for engaging Pakistan in, in trade and all that. So if, if we look at the 2015 stopover, it was followed by the Pathan Court and Nuri terrorist attacks. If we look at the sustained peace process of 2004 to 2008, it was followed by the Mumbai terrorist attack, non-state actors. So if you put yourself in the shoes of Indian decision makers, and if would you chance another another attempt at a, at a sustained peace process with India? If yes, if yes, I would like to know. But if not, what is it that Pakistan would need to do to change that perception in the Indian mind? Thank you. Uh, another question, please, and then we'll get the answers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful presentation, all uh, presented, uh, given here. I just ask that uh, I listen a lot of things, and this is good for my knowledge as well, that uh, we have many problems with the water security, regional security. We need culture exchange. We need trade. We need people-to-people well, -people contract, a lot of things. But why not we are using the, because government to government is contact is almost zero, a little bit. And uh, of course, political contact is not uh, very much back to diplomacy is uh, presently, presently not good. Why not we are using the uh, a platform of SARC 
in this uh, to to build the very good relation with the India and with the other countries, but particularly with India. Thank you, Dr. Puran. Ashi, you want to respond to the question of Sark after after uh, Dr. Farhan? Yeah, uh, let Farhan uh, respond to that and then I'll add to it. Okay. Okay, okay thank you for asking a most difficult question. <laughs> what if I put myself in Indian shoes and how do I see Pakistan and whether there is any sustained momentum? Uh, you know, in the 90s with with, with uh, what Dr. Saeed referred to, there was a time when, I meaning the good thing about India and Pakistan was that there were no preconditions Uh Let's not talk about this and let's not talk about that. Let's discuss all issues together. So for India, the core problem was terrorism. And Pakistan put it on the table. We'll discuss it. For Pakistan, Kashmir was the core conflict and India put it on the table. It was not like the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Oh, we'll do something, then we'll you know throw the can down the road and discuss Jerusalem at the end. Uh, the point for India today is, I think the problem is, uh, and the question to ask is, if the Congress government comes into power, will it resign, if, meaning it's not coming into power next year, but uh, will it resign what happened on August 5th, 2019? No. Right? So that's not happening. <clears throat> How do you motivate Indians in Pakistani or the Indian government or the Pakistani government to follow it? I think the best way to do it is to, you know, there's, there's, there was this interesting news item that came out. There's a lot of news that comes out in you know, media everywhere, but there was a certain event where, uh, I don't know if you heard it, it was, I think, Javed Chaudhary. He, he wrote something about his meeting with uh, Kamar Javed Bajwa, the ex-chief of army staff. And there was a certain, let's say, uh, movement about, you know, opening doors to India, Modi would come to Pakistan, stay at Hanglaj Mata for 10 days, you know, this this temple in Balochistan. And after 10 days, they would come out and they would sign an agreement. And one of the cornerstones of the, that agreement would be to freeze Kashmir for the next 10 years or 20 years, maybe. Right? Uh, and, and this is, I think, where the problem is. Don't talk about freezing the Kashmir conflict. Talk about the people of India and Pakistan. Talk about the people of Kashmir. Right, so when we are making the argument about national interest, how to motivate people, huh? Kashmir will come in time. But the initial, I think, moves from the Indian side would come from the fact that if we can, you know, speak about trade, if we can speak about business ties, if we can speak speak about investment, uh, so that's the motivator, right? And from the Pakistani side, it's the same. Speak about the people. Don't speak about your positions. Uh, uh, if you start from a very positional point of view, oh, no, we want the entire Kashmir for ourselves. Oh, no, no, we want the entire Kashmir for us. Then you're not going anywhere. Uh, so conflict resolution is done this way. So I think the motivator for India could well be from an Indian perspective could be that, you know, this is what we can do. Um, and from the Pakistani side, it would be to ensure that no incidents of, you know, as you rightly mentioned, the spoilers, if you will, in the peace process is something that Pakistan needs to care about. So I think the motivation can come from the Indian side, uh, based on the fact that they would want some sort of trade business ties to country. Yeah. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> okay, of course. Dr. Arshi, would you like to respond? Arshi? Uh, yeah. uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Can you hear me? Ji, ji, ji. Arshi, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I think uh, Dr. Farhan has already, um, yeah, Farhan has already, uh, yes, uh, can you, okay. Um, uh, you know, um, this whole thing because Channel and again, whenever this question is, um, you know, um, um, asked about I think there is a uh, internet connectivity issue. There was another question of using SARC as a forum. So, anyone would like to respond to it? 
Uh, I would like to say just add a short comment to what Dr. Farhan rightly answered. And he was very right. But I, I would like to add one more thing. That when we are when we will be ready to hand over this process to people to some extent that lets the let the people lead this process and take this into some direction and if we are not moving away from our positions then we must prepare ourselves for one reality and that is let's not be hostage to history let's learn lessons from history but not be hostages to history there might be new positions which will be more beneficial. There might be new realities which will be more beneficial. And uh, for I, I think for the next one decade, there should not be very decisive positions on either side. Because the way the world is transforming, it might offer us far more uh, new opportunities than we can think of. Then the second question was about Sark. In my understanding, uh, why did Sark not become a dependable organization for all countries of uh, South Asia was also because of India's very strong position uh, of being a hegemon, a regional hegemon, and not having any uh, collaboration with the countries. Like we take the example of Nepal. When they want to exploit the water resources of Nepal, Nepal they just block the trade routes of Nepal. So no vegetables, no water. Give us water as we want to exploit you will have your vegetables and fruits, very simply. So in SARC, I think the biggest obstacle is also India as a state, that it does not let SARC function as it is spirited to be. So uh, in, again, in the question of SARC, I think it would be more beneficial that let the people start and take some direction, not in the case of India, Pakistan all, only, also with Bangladesh, also with Nepal, also with Bhutan, also with Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zainab. Any any other question? Okay, Imran. <clears throat> yes, uh, whether it is track two or track three or track nine, all depends on uh, the track one mm -hmm. diplomacy. So, if there is no political will at the top level, there will be no progress in either uh, tracks. Mm -hmm. So, I think uh, this is my humble suggestion that. We should have an internal track through uh, process in which all the civil and military uh, leaders there, and we must uh, need to transform the mindset for the greater ownership of the track through. This is my uh, humble suggestion. My question is that the United States has been very influential in facilitating facilitating talks between Pakistan and India, and recently. Saudi Iran uh, rapprochement held, and this was uh, actually uh, the setback for uh, United States diplomacy. So, do you think the United States would take uh, interest again in India and Pakistan because it has also invested in India Pakistan? It was it has also invested in in um, having rapprochement in the Middle East. So, do you think there would be re uh, take of United States in that process. This is my. OK. <laughs> Anybody can answer it. Dr. Farhan. Yeah, I can go ahead. I, meaning, I, I completely agree with the first comment that you made. And that is what I said at the end of the presentation, that Pakistan and India better off being self-reflective first, assessing their own strategies vis-a-vis -vis each other, maybe evolving a common point of, you know, Assessing where they are, what they need to do, where they're at. And I think that's a good suggestion. Having a track to initially internally first and then moving on to, you know, having a uh, space where we can discuss these issues and go against each other. I think um, with, with the U.S., I think their aims for now uh, are minimalistic in South Asia in the sense that they want what they what they fear about the most more than anything else is the risk of a nuclear war. Uh, so it's they're not only speaking now. If you if you look at recent articles coming, they they're speaking about not South Asia, but they are invoking the term Southern Asia. So Southern Asia brings in China as well. So it's not about a nuclear security dilemma between Pakistan and India, but it's, it's now a security trilemma 
between Pakistan, India, and China. And that's one of the other fallouts, uh, you know, of India's domestication of Kashmir, that it has brought China into the Kashmir conflict. See what happened between, you know, uh, India and China, the border was 2020, 2021. So that's another face. But then again, despite the adversarial nature of the relationship last year, uh, the India-China trade was at $125 billion. It crossed $100 billion for the first time. So I think the, you know, answering your question, I think American aims are minimalistic in the sense of ensuring that uh, a crisis situation does not emerge, number one. Uh, and if it does, then preventing that crisis unfolding into a nuclear showdown uh, between India and Pakistan. But again, the, the Americans will... I think generally welcome any peace initiative that comes between India and Pakistan. Uh, I think they'll be supportive of it. Um, no? Can be the initiator as well, but I think their initiations are more, uh, you know, so to speak, there's, there's a lot of Indian resistance to it uh, in the sense that, you know, they do not want a third party to be involved, but they'll be more supportive of bilateral track to 1.5 or whatever, even back channel. Uh, that takes place. You know, the, the ceasefire agreement that was agreed upon 2021, it was? Oh, the, the first one, but the, the recent one was 2021, right? So that came as a result of Beg Channel, you know, no doubt, but of course it was denied by all sides. So yeah, so the Americans, I think, would, would, would agree to it. What, what Sorry, yes. you said about the track to within your own country, I would I would just like to add one thing, that yes, that that's very important. And that's what strategic communication says about, that have a complete network of communication in your own state also, and then communicate that network, entire network with the related networks in the, with the targeted audience. So that aims at just not achieving your target, but also transforming the environment within your area and also in the targeted area. And uh, Dr. Farhan very rightly said, I would just put it this way, that US would see if its interest is in India-Pakistan dialogues or not, no dialogues. And let's be very candid about every state has its own interests and it's driven by the interests. Right now, as far as I understand, India uh, is only looked at is being looked at by the U.S. as one very important actor in the overall Indo-Pacific policy, which Dr. Farhan said that they are referring to Southern Asia, how to counter China. Uh, Ambassador Nadeem Gaz also wants to, <laughs> and also uh, Arshi is waiting. So we have three comments. <laughs> okay, just I would like to respond to uh, that uh, first comment of track to within Pakistan. I think this is an, another important in the context because um, if you know, uh, especially the track of people to people contact has been a lot of misperceptions about it in overall state and uh, you know different sections. Uh, so you know, understanding what is the role of uh, you know people to people contacts and how it complements peace building and how it complements Pakistan's policy as well. That understanding for that understanding as well, you need that you know within ourselves that track to to understand what is the role of track to because there are a lot of misperceptions and misunderstandings in my understanding which need to be clarified and the other thing which i think for our own policy making on kashmir we don't have policy because we don't talk between ourselves so we have to talk between ourselves, especially vis-a-vis -vis Musharraf formula. We don't have a policy whether we, you know, are behind this or not. So we should have a specific, you know, we should be clear about this. Whether we want, um, I mean, pa the Pakistani state should be clear about this, that whether we want track to people to people context, whether they are helpful or not, and whether Musharraf's formula is something that Pakistan wants or not. We should have a specific, I think, answers for these. Arshi, uh, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, uh, I hope you can hear me now. It seems that yes, there was some issue. Audible. Yes, you are okay. audible. Um, I, uh, Imran uh, asked uh, something, and uh, I was just wondering uh, when we say your role of U.S. Um, in um, you know between India and Pakistan, uh, in any way, uh, you know, it, it, uh, we really have to see uh, what exactly we are talking about. If you are referring to mediation between India and Pakistan, obviously, uh, you know, it depends uh, if the country is interested enough.
to to come um you know um actively uh between the two countries but if you have to uh, really see a us as um you know a country which has a huge public diplomacy um you know uh, faction so expecting that there won't be anything going on uh, when the two nuclear states having hostile relations i think um, uh, it's it's not really a right approach uh, it is going on in us uh, public diplomacy uh, through that uh, you know uh, platform um, they will continue to engage they 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 remained um, you know engaged uh, during the time when we had severe uh, you know problems just immediately after uh, even after kargil and the indian parliament got us attacked i mean so it, it, you can't really rule out the role um, this is what i'm trying to say you just have to see whether we are expecting a direct mediatory role or a facilitator so that facilitation would remain but at the end of the day it's obviously india and pakistan that have to really engage and uh, sort their issues as far as the sark issue was concerned uh, whether sark is important or not i think we really have to see that um, it's the communication uh, between the hostile um, nations um, that channel actually you know uh, facilitates in their respective governments to take action and use those forums so we have the example of european union i mean if the european union we um, you know we we talk about it as a successful example but did it just happen like that that the, uh, the governments of these nations just decided to do it of course there was so much that was going on uh, you know at the societies level at the citizens level that made it possible that the public opinion uh, you know became such that the governments had to uh, take action so expecting that sark with this constitution the way it is um, would come up and uh, you know would be um, uh, do sub doing something uh, it's uh, perhaps uh, expecting too much it's the it's the continuous um engagement and being in the dialogue process that would eventually uh, you know make even that forum um active again or perhaps we will have something uh, that we would be uh, you know uh, expecting from that thank you well we were what imran basically spoke about he was very diplomatic when he's he's a, he's a greater diplomat than i am when he said track to diplomacy i think let's call a spade a spade and i think in this country there is a really a need of talking about the civil military relationship i think that's the most important thing because when you have people coming to this country they basically ask one question they may not ask it directly but indirectly they they refer to it that your policy is made somewhere and it is implemented elsewhere so when there is such a divide at least in the perception i'm not saying it's 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 in reality but if there is this particular perception that needs to be addressed regarding any policy with any country whether it is india whether it is afghanistan whether it is with the united states that's uh, that's the first thing so i think we should uh, we should be very clear about that we need to formulate a policy with about india and about kashmir i think that is absolutely essential realistically we need to have a relationship with india but probably in reality that relationship can only take place if you put kashmir on the back burner for a while because i don't think having a precondition of abrogating article 370 and expecting that a normal relationship or a somewhat relationship with india would continue that is um, that i don't think is possible well everybody has referred to the statement of uh, coming from an official of the indian high commission diplomats are always supposed to make those statements but i think if you are going to be looking at the indian elections i'm sure you are going to find very strong statements coming from the indian leadership regarding pakistan and kashmir i think that's a reality 
As far as the United States is concerned, well, it has chosen India as its partner in this particular region. And obviously, the aim is containment of China. I'm sure the Americans will be very receptive to any bilateral engagement which takes place between Pakistan and India. I don't think with their present relationship with India and with the present economic relationship which they have, they are going to be initiators of any 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 dialogue between uh, the two rivals. Obviously, um, nuclear uh, war is something which the entire world uh, wants never to happen. So efforts will continue on that. And I think uh, more than anything, if there is a deterrent between India and Pakistan, it is the nuclear weapons and it is not the conventional armament. I think the fear of a nuclear uh, war is something which actually allows some sanity to prevail on both sides. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, President. Thank you very much, panelists. And also the pen, uh, participants for a very candid and informative uh, discussion. I think the next round table should be on the question of how real is India's existential threat to Pakistan on which our foreign policy is based. Um, uh, in the end, I would just like to quote uh, Anselm Storrs, who wrote many years ago, that a society is a negotiated order, and if you are capable of getting all you want all the time, you have better learned how to negotiate. So in case of India and Pakistan, it's better for both the countries to learn to negotiate with each other before it's too late. Thank you very much, and hope we, are, we will have some other interactions with all of you. Thank you. <laughs>